And Gordon Ramsay has managed to get a lot of squatters out of his unoccupied pub. They said that they were in there for the benefits of the community. Shut up. I'm asking you, should squatters be allowed to occupy empty property? One of my panel says yes. The other says no. So what says you? And last but not least, the National Trust. Is it just me or do they seem to be losing the plot? I've got all that to come and more before seven. But before we get stuck in, let's cross live for tonight's six o'clock news with Polly Middlehurst. Well, our top story from GB News tonight is that Downing Street says the attempt by police in Brussels to shut down the National Conservatism Conference is extremely disturbing. Officers arrived while GB News presenter Nigel Farage was addressing the event, giving everyone 15 minutes to leave the venue. It's understood the order came from the local Brussels mayor, Emir Keir, in a move he said was to guarantee public safety. Belgium's Prime Minister has, within the last half hour, described today's events as unacceptable and said banning political meetings is unconstitutional. The former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, spoke to Nigel Farage after her own speech at conference. Thankfully, you and I got to make our speeches in favour of controlling our borders and protecting our communities amongst like-minded Democrats. Many of us there are democratically elected politicians. Many of us are leaders in our field, academics, thinkers, writers. And it's frankly staggering that the mayor of Brussels has deployed his thought police to cancel what is a peaceful event focused on how we can better represent the millions of people around the European continent. Well, as you can imagine, this is a fast-moving story that's got a lot of people hot under the collar today in Brussels and on this side of the water. The National Conservatism uh, Think Tank website has said today, we thank the Belgian Prime Minister for his unequivocal support. Let me just read you what Alexander de Croo said. He said, what happened at Claridge today is unacceptable. Municipal autonomy is a cornerstone of our democracy but can never overrule the Belgian constitution, guaranteeing the freedom of speech and peace peaceful assembly since 1830, he says. Banning political meetings is unconstitutional, full stop. No doubt, lots more happening on that story throughout the rest of the evening here on GB News. Well, Labour's Wes Streeting poked fun at Suella Bravman's absence from the Commons today. By a local member for Fareham who couldn't be here today with us, Mr Deputy Speaker, because she's currently in Brussels, surrounded by uh, the police who are trying to sh shut down the event she's attended with some far-right fanatics um, with whom she has much in common. Well, away from events in Brussels, the Rwanda bill is back in the House of Lords tonight after MPs rejected last night a series of amendments they'd suggested, with some Conservatives calling the proposals ridiculous. However, the Lords are maintaining their standoff with the government on its flagship migration policy. If you're watching on television, these live pictures coming to us from the upper chamber, they're demanding Rishi Sunak's deportation plan ensures due regard, they say, for human rights and modern slavery concerns. Downing Street has responded to the Lord saying it's hoping to clear the final hurdle this week and get flights off the ground within weeks. But Labour has insisted the scheme is doomed to fail. Policing Minister Chris Philp says new powers for chief constables to sack rogue officers will root out those unfit to wear the badge. Under the new powers, chief constables will be put in charge of misconduct hearings, making it much easier to remove officers in their own force who are found guilty. The changes, which come into a force next month, follows a review into police dismissals after the conviction of David Carrick for multiple sex offences while serving as a police officer. Departures and arrivals at Birmingham Airport were temporarily halted today after reports of a suspicious device on an Aer Lingus flight to Belfast. We've since heard that, uh, in fact, the airport has now fully reopened, but the crew made the discovery on the aircraft um, and returned, having already taken off. The airport has told us now that customers who are due to travel can now check in as normal. The Education Secretary has said a court ruling dismissing a Muslim student's challenge against her school prayer ban now gives school heads confidence in making the right decision to prioritise 
tolerance between those of different faiths. The student had argued that a no-prayer ritual policy at a school in North London was discriminatory, uh, but the head teacher argued schools shouldn't be forced to change their approach because a child decided it was something they didn't like. The judge upheld the school's position, saying there was a rational connection between the school's inclusivity, social cohesion and its prayer policy. Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch also said the ruling was a victory against activists trying to subvert public institutions. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, has denied that a ban on tobacco and vape sales will cause a black market boom. If you're watching on TV, let's take a look inside the Commons, where the tobacco and vapes bill is being brought before MPs for the first time. Full discussion going on there. If it becomes law, it would be an offence to sell tobacco products to anyone born after the 1st of January 2009. And just lastly, you've heard of April showers, but in Dubai... The desert cities, usually blue skies, have been hit by awful rain, in fact, thunderstorms, and the authorities have told people to just stay at home. Pictures coming into us show cars swamped with water, waves buffeting traffic, roads brought to a standstill, and Dubai Airport saying it's temporarily diverting flights this evening until those weather conditions improve. But forecasters are saying another wave of unstable weather is on the way. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen, or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you very much for that, Polly. I'm Michelle Dubry, keeping you company till 7 o'clock tonight. Welcome, my panel alongside me. For the ride, the Conservative candidate for Finchley and Golders Green, Alex Dean, and the author and political organiser, James Schneider. Good evening to both evening of you, to you, gents. You're very welcome. And also, you know the drill on this programme. It's very much about you guys as well. What's on your mind tonight? There's lots I want to talk to you about. We'll come into uh, that massive legal ruling in just a second when it comes to that school and the Muslim... Uh, students' right to prayer. We'll come on to that one, worry not. But I also want to talk to you about what on earth has been going on in Brussels. Have you seen that? The police being called while Nigel Farage uh, was on the stage. What is this issue um, with people having the audacity to be on the right of politics? People get very hot under the collar, uh, don't they? So I want to talk about that, the smirking stuff as well. Also, squatters. Do you think they should be able to um, basically occupy empty property, commercial property, or not? And if I can squeeze it in, because there's a lot to get through tonight, National Trust. Are they losing the plots? Get in touch with me all the usual ways, but also on the website as well, gbnews.com slash your say. But a big story today, and this is a really big deal, actually. It's been called a victory for all schools. This was the case which saw a Muslim pupil and her mum, actually, take a school to court at the Michaela School in London. She was basically saying she was essentially being discriminated against because she wasn't uh, given the opportunity to pray during the school day. And a High Court judge now uh, has basically ruled that the school was acting in a manner that was lawful and she was not being discriminated against. This is a big case, this, because if it had gone yeah. the other way, Alex, the um, uh, ramifications for this could have been potentially quite huge. That's right, but I don't actually think this is a debate or a judgment about prayer. I think it's a debate and a judgment about schools being able to decide, to decide their own rules, which is a principle which I completely support. Uh, the judgment is, to the extent that I've been able to digest it, is excellent. And it makes the point that the parents and the child concerned impliedly accepted the school's secular position when mm. um, they, uh, uh, during the course of the admission process and uh, drawn as they were explicitly, as they say, to this school because it was strict. Uh, and the school says uh, this is not a school where people pray. And the head teacher, no um, stranger to the headlines herself, has made it clear this is not about persecuting some minority in the school. Indeed, as it happens, she makes the point it's a Muslim majority school. Mm. It's the point about having the same rules for everybody, minority and majority alike. So the point is, any harm done to your rights is uh, legitimate and proportionate to achieving the legitimate aims of the school, which is education and fairness to all pupils, and I think it's the right decision. Uh, before I bring you in, James, let's just listen. Uh, the head teacher who mentioned there, Catherine Burble, saying she was speaking out. This is her earlier on this year. Listen to what she had to say. We all need to recognise that all of us need to make sacrifices for the betterment of the whole so that we can all get on and that schools play such an important part of this. Now, obviously, if your school is one where the children roam the corridors and the children do whatever they like during lunch, 
then I suppose you might choose to have a prayer room and that's fine. You know, I'm not suggesting that all schools shouldn't have a prayer room. But I do think that if a school's ethos is such and building is such that they cannot have a prayer room, then... James, what do you make to it all? So I broadly agree with Alex on the legal front and that this is more to do with um, what schools are allowed to decide and if they are deciding it equally for um, all pupils of, of different faiths. Um, it does seem that the way the school have managed it, it Im implies isn't, hasn't been managed terribly well, both from that clip we just heard and then there's a little bit from the judgment that the, the child was temporarily expelled from the school or temporarily excluded suspended, from the school. Yeah. Suspended, yeah. Um, and that was overturned by the, the judge. So it seems like on the legal front, this is probably going in the right direction, but it suggests that... You know, if a pupil is trying to pray, suspension is probably not no, the right way. No, she wasn't suspended for trying to uh, pray. She was uh, suspended. Um, one of the accusations was that she'd threatened to stab another pupil. So oh, the two, well, the two were not... That's completely yeah, separate. The two were not, yeah. That's what and, I'm saying. The two were not the, linked. Yeah, yeah so, so it's, anyway, so, so, so that's a, uh, a separate thing. Just from hearing um, the head teacher there, I think there were... If your school has a rule that you're a secular school and you basically don't do religion, I think that's absolutely fine. That's up to schools to decide. I think if pupils in that school wish to, you know, in their prayer, in the not the prayer time, sorry, in the um, in a break, you know, break between lessons, go into an empty classroom and pray together, that should also be absolutely fine. But no, absolutely. and this is the crux of the point. So this is what she's saying, Alex. Yeah. So the, the head teacher, this is the real crux of this. Because yeah. this girl, this student was essentially saying, you know, I want to do like, I think it's, um, was it one o'clock or whatever time it is? She wanted sure. to do it during the break. At the time that suits me and in the manner that suits me and with the people that suits me, the trouble is, mm -hmm. you know, of course, you don't know if, I was praying during your introduction, uh, and to my, as it happens, I wasn't, but I might have been silently praying away and doing no harm. One reads between the lines here a bit and thinks, yeah, once you start the group of children praying in the square, bear in mind, Muslim majority school, once a, a group of them start praying, are those who don't join in bad Muslims? And are those who don't join in because they're not Muslims then excluded from the activity? And you can see why the school is trying to maintain a universal rule and trying to keep community cohesion together by saying no prayers for everyone. I note that in the judgment, it was said by the judge that prior to this attempt to legitimise prayer in school, the child knew that they couldn't pray at school mm -hmm. and would save up their prayers and, and do it at home. Well, they already knew that it was that they weren't supposed to pray in school. That's what they signed up for when they applied. Indeed. And one of the things, actually, that I find quite interesting is she, the, the head teacher, she's talking about, you know, if you've got faith schools or whatever, uh, then ultimately you as a school should have the right not to have things like the black group, the Hindu group, the Muslim group, the LGBT group, etc., etc., She prides herself this school. I mean, I've got to say for the record, I think this sounds like an absolutely fabulous school. I would be absolutely delighted if my child uh, went to this school. It's rated outstanding by Ofsted and all the rest of it. But there has been quite a ramification to this. Listen to Catherine, uh, the head teacher, again, Jim, some of the comments that she's made uh, about this. Support staff right now. They come and see me very frightened. Um, uh, they're really scared. And gosh, last year, my goodness, I mean, that, that was the worst. Um, it was, uh, I mean, they're, they're, uh, it's not right that um, uh, a head teacher or teachers should be put under that kind of stress because they're just trying to do their jobs. It's not right. And if you don't like the rules of the school, don't send your kid there. It's not difficult, is it? I couldn't hear what she was referring. She, well, she was basically she was saying under teachers, a lot of stress, but yeah, it didn't teachers say what it was. Um, were um, hassled. Apparently, there'd been some uh, apparent death, uh, not death threats. So, with bomb threats made towards this school, uh, teachers being threatened and things like that. Well, of course, I mean, no school should get bomb threats no. or threatened of any sort, and, and and nor should nor should any you know any teachers. And we're now starting to talk about things that. I, you know, I, we we probably all of us don't know very much about, but I certainly don't know much well, about the details. But I think that you know there are there are two things which we can separate out here. One is the legal thing, and the other is how not to do with the law, 
but how can you run a school in a way that is that, that is inclusive within the parameters of which you've already set? You're absolutely right. They're separate debates, yeah. but there are also there's an interesting connection because you're entitled to say I want to do this indeed to test your position in law. I want to be able to do this in in my school. And the school's entitled to say back in the end, if you don't like it, choose another school. But then you fray at the boundaries of what's acceptable in society. You un, you fray at what underpins us as a as a liberal democracy to say if I don't get my way, rather than just accepting the judgment, or rather than just accepting what the headmaster says, or what the school rules say, I'm going to threaten you, and I'm going to say I'm going to come and do you harm unless I get my way. And at that point, no matter how much sympathy I might have had w with your right to take a position or say that you want to do something, I've got no time for that at all. Yeah, of course. I mean, if anyone is saying that they're going to do another person harm, physical yeah. harm, etc., I mean, that you, the, when you have lost a debate, then you start hitting the other person on the yeah. head. So, uh, I mean, I think we can, uh, you know, we can all we can all agree on that. I think this mother, this uh, pupil, she's got a cheek, quite frankly, because um, she apparently wants to send a, a sibling, a second child to this school come September. But then she also says, oh, and by the way, um, apparently uh, there's another issue that she's not happy with uh, and has apparently sent a letter to the lawyers of the school. I mean, you couldn't make it up sometimes, no, I think. But, I, I, but I want... that, may not, that may not be true. As in, it might be, we, again, we don't know, but it could be the case where you've got a parent who likes the school because the school is very good, it's rated outstanding, etc. but they would like some aspect of its policy to be different. Ordinarily, when we see that in other circumstances, we say, well, that's an engaged parent, that's a, that's a good thing. doesn't mean that she's going to get her way. It yes. doesn't mean that they're going to change the policy because she would like it, but she's perfectly entitled to say, I like the school, I want to be part of it, but I would like this thing to be different. And then yes. the school is also perfectly entitled to say, we've heard you, but no. I might put the emphasis slightly differently. Parents are entitled to express their views about how things might be different at their schools. And as you rightly say, it demonstrates engagement in the school community to do so. But there is a hypocrisy in saying, I am drawn to this school because of these values. I'm drawn to it because I want it to be the, um, you know, successful and strict in the way that it is. And now I insist, at the point of taking you to court, that you are different to the way that things are. Mm. And that's that, I think, is a bit much. There's another key point to this, and many of you at home, you've already started getting in touch with me and asking me this question, Michelle, who's paid for all of this? Well, the answer is you. Uh, and this is the, uh, one of the points yeah. that Catherine Bebel Singh, the head teacher, brings up in her letter. Uh, she actually asks, can it be right for a family to receive £150,000 of taxpayer-funded legal aid to bring a case like this? Well, I and imagine then... that you'd both say that that's a good thing because you think that this is a very good judgment. And so for £150,000 to have found this judgment, which goes in the direction that you want, which is now in law, does not seem to be a bad spending of money. It's not a spending of money when legal aid is spent, it isn't only for the people that it is uh, whose case it is. The purpose is it's, it's for performing some kind of societal function. And in this case, which is setting out some legal framework that can be then taken forward, it, that's really the work it's done, rather than for um, the mother and the daughter who didn't get what they were after uh, wanted anyway. You're a barrister. Yeah, what do you think? I, I don't think I agree. And the reason I think I don't agree is that I don't think this was a point of, of law of general interest until the parents decided to take their own school uh, through the legal process. Indeed, I think the people would largely have imagined the settled point was that headmasters are entitled to, certainly within the framework of admissions, to uh, govern their own schools. So I'm not sure it was a point of general public interest in the way you imply. But moreover, there is... There's a broader point here for me too, which is that unless you have unlimited funds, which no state does, you have to decide what you spend your resources on. And our legal aid budget is, no pun intended, already criminally underfunded. Yeah. And if you are deciding where that money goes, in my view, defending to the best of our ability people who are accused of crimes so as to ensure they have the best possible representation in court, because those are the cases in which people can go to prison, must take priority over cases like this, which uncharitably might be discarded, described as rather frivolous. One of my viewers, Helen, says, Michelle, come on. On, a prayer for five minutes a day during lunchtime should be allowed. But, Helen, it would be a slippery slope, though, because they have this um, kind of policy where they call it... They break bread. All of the pupils have vegetarian meals. They all sit together. They all are collective during lunch. I just want to read you as well. There's, it's a really good statement. Uh, you could go and uh, look it up yourselves. But she says things like, oh, Michaela, we want our children to live lives of dignity, whether they end up poor or rich later in life. A life of meaning is not about being rich. Uh, we believe that purpose and moral 
character matter and that there is such thing as moral truth. We tell our kids to be top of the pyramid and our goal for them isn't to be the richest or even the most famous or even the cleverest. It is to be someone who lives a life of moral worth shaped by self-sacrifice, filled with gratitude for what they have and doing all that they can to help those who have not. I think it's a really interesting uh, statement that you should all read it but one of the things uh, that she talks about a lot in this uh, statement is the fact that they have conservative small c values and they pride themselves as having that after the break this is exactly the point that i want to explore because in brussels the police have been called to try and close down an event uh, that was all about national conservatism so let's explore this shall we why is being of the right uh, politically such an issue for some see you in two GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. I don't think you can go and watch a Shakespeare play unless you already know it. It's yes. almost like you have to understand the story, story. and the characters yeah. and perhaps have even done a bit of reading into it. Because if you went completely blind, especially in today's world where we don't speak in that kind of way, um, it is, I think, probably a bit alienating. But Dawn, Dawn is saying it is alienating at the moment because of the lack of uh, representation. I, you know, what, the actual phrasing they use, right, OK. The disproportionate representation um, propagated white, able Bodied, heterosexual cisgender male narratives. I'm sure there's people sitting in a room going, What's the most ridiculous thing we can come up with today? Yes. But are really, just chuck all these words and it's cisgender and it's just insane. Mm. Of course, Shakespeare was what it was back in the day, and that's why it is, it's mostly blokes and they're mostly white. And lots of speculation that he was actually gay, isn't there? Because he never really saw Anne Hathaway very often and stayed away a lot of the time. I don't know, he, maybe he was a big He might have gay been transgender icon. for all I, I know. I mean, I, I don't... I... <laughs> Biggins, I'm looking at you. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think uh, that goes for the profession too. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's... Uh, I, I, I do think we... I mean, I remember seeing Macbeth in London with Judi Dench and Ian McKellen, and it was one of the most exciting wow. evenings ever. And it was a cold night at the Donmar Theatre, outside and inside, and it, that gave it atmosphere. There are certain things, and then you go along and see something else, and you think, I'll walk out in the interval. Yeah. Macbeth is, is so a sexy bad. play, though. Let's talk about... Um, oh, there's so many. Can I live to be 100? Oh, um, this is depressing. I think it is depressing. Oh. I like to stay here and now. I don't want to live to 100. Oh, don't and say I'm that. right behind you. I don't you. even want to. My father died at 63. That'll be me gone this year. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Dubry and I'm with you till 7 o'clock tonight alongside me, Alex Dean and James Schneider remain. We were just talking um, about the Michaela School just before the break, actually. Uh, a couple of you have gotten in touch saying, why should, the, why should we have any kind of uh, faith schools at all anyway? Why aren't all schools uh, secular? That would solve a lot of issues um, in society, some of you are suggesting. Did you, did you know that Swella Braverman was one of the, uh, essentially like a founding governor of the Michaela Academy? I did. Did you know that, James Schneider? 
Did you know that at home? I confess, actually, I did not know that. Um, anyway, the Michaela Academy, one of the things that they say is that they positively embrace small c conservative values. Um, and they talk about things like gratitude, agency, personal responsibility, uh, the refusal of identity politics, victimhood, a love of country, hard work, kindness, a duty towards others, self-sacrifice for the betterment of the whole, mm. etc. Which got me then thinking about said conservative values because over in Brussels, I mean, I've got to say, I was watching this live today because uh, the National Conservative Conference was taking place. Now, this conference, essentially, they had uh, their venue cancelled uh, twice. So there was now on their third venue attempt today. And long story short, um, uh, the mayor of Brussels decided that he didn't want this to happen. Uh, he was essentially saying that it needed to be shut down for public safety. Nigel Farage was on the stage. It was, it was gripping it. It was better than any drama I've watched recently, I can tell you that. You had the police at the door. It was really, really gripping stuff. Anyway, Nigel Farage, let's listen to what he had to say. Well, they don't like alternative points of view. I mean, you know, I'm used to this. I mean, when I was an MEP here in my last few years, I was banned from restaurants, banned from pubs, even banned from coffee shops uh, because I had a different point of view to that that was prevailing and backed up by big money and big business here. Um, but this is that was me on a private level. This is very much on a public stage. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. And you know what? If anything ever, ever made me think that Brexit was the right thing to do. It's the events here in Brussels today. Uh, the mayor of the city has just described and he was saying, and I quote, the far right is not welcome. Or one of the other speakers, there was Suella Braverman. Uh, let's take a listen to her. It's pretty astonishing, Nigel, isn't it? Um, thankfully, you and I got to make our speeches in favour of controlling our borders and protecting our communities amongst like-minded Democrats. Many of us there are democratically elected politicians. Many of us are leaders in our field, academics, thinkers, writers. And it's frankly staggering that the mayor of Brussels has deployed his thought police to cancel what is a peaceful event focused on how we can better represent the millions of people around the European continent. Well, look, so we're streeting. He um, had this to say earlier. Listen. Right, an honourable member for Fareham, who couldn't be here today with us, Mr Deputy Speaker, because she's currently in Brussels, surrounded by uh, the police who are trying to sh shut down the event she's attending with some far-right fanatics um, with whom she has much in common. Extraordinary, really, and I didn't know I was going to say this until I saw that clip of where streeting. Labour joking about this really sends a shiver down the spine. Is this what we are to expect if we get a Labour government? Free speech just for those people with whom you agree? Because that is no free speech at all. Belief in a free society and a free speech means standing up for the rights of people you despise. Now, I dare say, I hope that they've got a more convivial relationship than that. I hope that they're parliamentary sparring partners, but where streeting doesn't despise Suella Bradman. But even if he does, he ought not seek to ban her views or laugh at those who do. I dare say the mayor of Brussels has given this conference far more attention than it would ever, ever otherwise have uh, received, and it's probably backfired on him to an extent. But I would say to the mayor of Brussels, you know, if you disagree with uh, people, then feel free to say why you disagree with them. Feel free to argue with them or even disparage and mock them, but don't seek to ban them. I think it's actually quite chilling, James, that because you can politically disagree with someone, you wheel out this label, this far-right label, that just gets wheeled out so often now. It's just come... To me, it's almost meaningless now because it's just used like con confetti, basically, to me, I disagree with you. But this notion that you can have the police literally chomping at the bit at the door, then they went in, they gave them 15 minutes, basically, uh, to read these documents and agree to close down the conference and so on. I find it quite chilling. What do you think? Well, you're right to find it chilling. Um, the police shouldn't be going round in any country shutting down political meetings, regardless of how distasteful you find them. And there will be a lot uh, said at the NatCon conference that will be extremely distasteful that should be attacked, as there was when it was held in London, as it is when it is held in the US. There's much to disagree about it. But they should be allowed to go and say it so that it can be disagreed with. And this is a, a worrying trend. Earlier in your presentation, um, you were suggesting it's something that is only done to the right, and I don't think that's the case at all. For example, 
Just a few days ago, there was a conference in Berlin, uh, the Palestine Conference, which was shut down by 2,000 police officers who uh, prevented entering in um, uh, British-Palestinian um, uh, doctor Hassan uh, Abu Sitter, who was meant to give testimony about what was happening in hospitals in Palestine. And that was shut down. The live feed was shut off. And the people who were participating, including Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek finance minister, is banned from entry to Germany and banned from even participating in Zooms that could have Germans on them. And I think this is a very worrying trajectory that we, that, that we should all, all stand against. I'll give you the ultimate irony, which is that this mayor of Brussels, not some past predecessor, this mayor of Brussels, has appeared on a stage with the mayor of Tehran, who is sanctioned by the EU. And his defence, when challenged about that, was just appearing on a panel with somebody doesn't mean you agree with them. Well, quite! You know, having hosting people in a city uh, and allowing them to have public discourse doesn't mean you agree with them. Of course, we've all immediately become experts experts on the Belgian constitution, haven't we? <laughs> and the Belgian constitution guarantees freedom of speech and assembly. Well, that wasn't much in evidence here, and I look forward to the Brussels government, the, the Belgian government, saying this mayor is completely off base. And I'll just give you one more point, because in a, if in a parallel world I were the mayor of London, <laughs> and James uh, uh, had some meeting with his far-left mates, I wouldn't dream of tasking the police with shutting them down. And if I did, I hope the police would refuse my, law, my unlawful order. Because this is wholly against free speech and, moreover, from the so-called capital of the European Union. The next time the EU tries to say Putin or Orban or Trump has done something authoritarian and overreached their powers, something they, they don't like, those authoritarian right-wingers will say, why shouldn't I? Because that's what happens in the heart of your beloved EU. And you know what? They'll be right. Well, the Prime Minister, actually, of Belgium, he um, has written on Twitter X and said, what happened at the Claridge today, so that's the venue that there was hosting that at, it's unacceptable, basically. Uh, he goes on about um, uh, um, uh, municipal autonomy is a cornerstone of our democracy, but can never, ever rule the, ben the Belgium um, uh, constitution, guaranteeing the freedom of speech and peaceful assembly since 1830. Uh, Banning political meetings is unconstitutional, Full stop. Good for the he Prime says. Minister of Belgium, which is, of course, something I say all the time. <laughs> what about this weird notion? Um, this weird overuse of the phrase far right, because I feel that this just gets wheeled out all the time, and basically what it means is people I just disagree with. I don't think it, it does mean that. Of course, any term can be used sloppily, far left, or hard left, or far right, or so on. They can be used sloppily. Um, I, I do think that. Um, I haven't looked at the full guest list and everything that they have to say, but there have been people that are further to the right than the hard right who have participated in these, um, in these uh, events. But, I mean, these are analytical terms. They're not just... Um, and they should be used as such. So we shouldn't be afraid of calling people far right when they're, when they're far right, but it shouldn't be used in a way that... I don't think anyone's approved. afraid of calling anyone far right. People use it all the time and they use it, if you ask me, as a, a way of shaming. So what they think is, oh, if I shout far right to them because essentially they want controlled immigration, then they'll feel so ashamed uh, that they'll all kind of wither and be silent. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but then the other flip side... Alex, unless you want to respond on that far right. Well, I just say uh, I agree. I get called far right on the social media for expressing the kinds of views we're uh, discussing tonight. I think all too often it does mean I disagree with you, uh, but I get to disagree with you without having the burden of explaining why or why you're wrong. I just call you far right, and therefore I'll, uh, I'm able to dismiss you. But then the flip side of this is many people will also argue that the Conservatives are your party. They're not even conservative anymore. So, for example, uh, you've got this vote tonight on the tobacco and vapes bill. Uh, many people would argue that true conservati conservatives would allow people to make choices that are perhaps bad for them. And why would you be well, busying yourselves with bills like that? So, two things. First of all, of course, the Conservative Party is a broad church. It includes everyone from Suella Brabman, which you rightly described on the right, which is where I am, uh, to all the way uh, through to lefties who think we, in the Conservative sense, who think we should have remained in the European Union and so forth. Although we have our own in internal family disagreements from time to time. On the point you make about the smoking ban, I would just make the point that whilst uh, the Prime Minister is seeking to introduce legislation uh, with which uh, the Labour Party is now supporting and says we'll get over the line, I think they're probably right, he's doing so in a free vote. 
and I, as a candidate selected by the Conservative Party, regard that free vote as applying to candidates as well as members of Parliament. Is it a good so use of, of Conservative government no, time? No, well, I was just going to make the point that I think it's completely wrong. You know, oh, right. uh, and I, I as, a, as someone who's been selected by uh, my party, feel free to say that in the course of having a free vote about it. But I will just make the point too, and I don't know what James thinks about this, the last time restrictions on kind of personal choice issues like this went through the House of Commons, on the left, people like John Reid and Tessa Jowell and John Prescott voted against restricting people's ability to make these decisions for themselves. In part, they did it because the working man's freedom after a hard day to go out and have a pint or a smoke shouldn't be restricted. And in part, they did it because there was broad cross-party consensus on liberalism. Would that return? Would it? Uh, will we ever... Be a more liberal. Well, I suppose I meant would, would that it would that it, we could have it back would be lovely. But will will that return in the Labour Party? Because the, the the strongest debate in this is within the Conservative Party. Some saying it's right, some saying it's wrong. Mm. The Labour Party is united in this kind of nanny state control freakery. Do you agree with that? Um, I think that probably the Labour Party is just doing what it always does, which is agreeing with the government because it thinks that <laughs> it's the, that's the best way to, to, to win the election. You're a hard man to debate, James. Um, when you say the right, you say true things. <laughs> Um, I, the answer is I, I hope so. I think that um, this is a this is a, a stupid ban, and I do think that um, there's a long-standing tradition that is much more focused on freedom on the left, especially in the left of the Labour Party, that is not in favour of, of um, this sort of stuff Spots. at all and has Spots been on. against it for, for, a, for a long time. Can I squeeze in one point, Michelle? You may. Which is, believing in liberty means nothing at all if you just defend things that everyone likes and are yeah. good for you. Sometimes liberty means defending things that you don't like and the right of grown adults to decide things that are bad for them. And, and long may that remain so. Um, Kevin says Michelle Westreeting should be forced to apologise for that comment uh, he made in Parliament. I don't see that happening, do you? Uh, Andy says Michelle, I don't personally believe that there is a left and a right narrative anymore. It's just a fight between two intolerant sides who both have the arrogance to be certain that they are right. The pol uh, political debate has become too toxic to be healthy for democracy. He says, I hope that I'm wrong. Is he wrong or do you agree with that? Has it all got too toxic? Uh, are people too arrogant on either side of the debate? Give me your thoughts on that. Speaking about people who are arrogant, by the way, do you think that people should be able to occupy their words, not mine? Empty buildings, squatters. What do you think to them? See you in two. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction. And with isobars out and opening out as well, lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland. Parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. A touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go. But generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. The latest GB News travel. Good evening, my name is Johnny Ratner with the latest long queues on the clockwise M25. The two outside lanes are closed, junction 13 to 14 between the Staines exit and Heathrow. That's past the scene of an accident. Also, if you're heading away from London down the M3, residual delays looking at the cameras continue. Junction 3 to 4 between the Bagshot and Camberley exits. All lanes have now reopened. Very still on the M1 northbound up to junction 10 through Bedfordshire to the Luton Airport spur exit into those roadworks. 
And if you're making your way for public transport this evening, severe delays on the Bakerloo line, Stonebridge Park to Harren, Wildstone, C2C trains are suspended by Upminster Eastbound and are barking to Pitsy and Grey. Services are being diverted by Purfleet due to overhead line problems. And finally, on the underground, severe delays on the district line, as we understand from TfL, as due to early signaling problems at West Kensington. And that's the very latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hi there, Michelle Dubry till seven alongside the Conservative candidate for Finchley and Golders Green, Alex Dean, and the author and political organiser James Schneider. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's talk squatters, shall we? Have you seen uh, the goings on? Uh, there was a pub essentially that's owned by Gordon Ramsay. Um, it's got a value. It's up for sale with a price tag of £13 million. Long story short, these squatters went into there um, and they said they had the right to occupy this venue essentially because it wasn't residential. Uh, they put this note on basically saying to people, essentially, don't cross this threshold, we're allowed to be there. They had the, uh, there was called like the Camden Arts uh, Community or something like that. They turned it into like a little bit of a soup kitchen. They allowed like um, artists to come in and display their work. Anyway, they've now been served notice, they've had to cancel their planned soup kitchen for today and be gone. Alex, yeah. what do you think to this? I think it's a recipe for anarchy to reward behaviour like this. The police and the law, in my view, are far too soft on what a real menace it is to people's lives and businesses uh, to let people squat. It can ruin uh, the lives of people, both in residential and commercial um, settings. And if you are on someone else's property unlawfully, I think the police in this country should remove you with extreme prejudice. Do you agree with that? No, I, I don't. I think that um, when a building isn't being used, I don't think there's anything wrong with it being squatted, especially if it's used for some social purpose. I mean, uh, let's take a, you know, any high street in Britain that it's, is full of shuttered shops. I think if some of those were taken over and opened up for some community activity that, you know, I don't know, activists were running a soup kitchen or... Um, helping people back into work or whatever it might be in uh, in a particular in a particular venue, I think is uh, I think would be a good thing. James, and if I you think go on holiday for a fortnight, am I entitled as long as I've got a good enough social purpose to take over your house? No, but that's right. not. So, what, if you believe in property rights for you, why can't the rest of us have them? Well, firstly, I. I... Imagine you and I don't have the same idea of property rights for starters. But secondly, I, for sure. but I think that um, me going on holiday from my rented flat for two weeks is okay. rather different. Let's say six months. Is you, go on, you go on holiday is, for a nice six-month tour. Is and I take it over for five months with my social purpose. Uh, is rather different to the boarded up, uh, you know, the boarded up commercial building that, that is not being brought back to life. Or they broke in, or, right? Like I break into your flat, but that's okay, right? Because I've got a social purpose in doing so. I'm going to run a soup kitchen out of your flat for five months while you're on tour. Well, Is that OK? There, 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 are lots of, um, uh, there are lots of shops that are boarded up down is the it, road that you can okay do that better. Is it OK to use your flat as a soup kitchen, James? I've got a good social purpose. Uh, no, you've got on I'm, your, I'm you've coming got on the back James there. speaking tour, right? You've got on the Schneider speaking tour for six months. And just for five months of that... You're auditioning I'm through my agent. I'm going to and, and you'd be a great speaker too. And I'm going to take your flat over for five months in the middle of it. No, but right? I don't think that is remotely comparable to, for example... Explain the difference to me. Uh, I'll explain it very easily. OK. A bank that is shutting... Uh, that is shut down, it's, it's left its purposes... Uh, left, it, left its premises, it's still there, it's in the middle of town and that gets taken over, there's no, um, no one... It's not using it instead of somebody else because there's no, uh, there's no other tenant who's there and it's used for some other purpose. I think that seems perfectly fine, perfectly sensible and not comparable to your example so where your you come over and commercial... fiddle around with my drawers. So is your distinction commercial v residential then? Um, not... I mean, 
it, the, if, the, if someone's living there, if it's someone's home, then that's a completely different matter, right? What but about if it's, if it's someone's if, holiday home and they reside in a different country? Uh, you know, probably not, but I, for example, I can see a circumstance in Namibia, for example, which has a very large um, uh, uh, problem with lack of housing and landlessness. I can see some example where you would say, well, that is morally right in, the, in such and such a circumstance. But anyway, we're dealing very much with yeah. edge cases here. Less, let's get, less, let's, less Namibia, more High Street. Let's, let's um, imagine you're banking or indeed a pub example like this one. It's Boarded up, yes, but that means people have broken in to get there. You say that's OK. I say, how do you know it's not going to be used for, how, for so, X, X amount of time? Mm. How do you know what business plans are being made for that, which are being stymied, along with the employment opportunities, along with the rejuvenation that may take place by the presence of those squatters, who are then effectively demanding that the state move them on? Otherwise, they'll stay there for as long as they like. Well... I mean, as you probably know, that isn't ordinarily what does happen with squatters. They often come to an agreement with the landlord about when they're, when they're going to take it back because they're going to put in some other commercial tenant. Basically, what you've got here is property that nothing is happening in for a short period of time, potentially a medium period of time, and it's being used for some other purpose. And that is, you know, that's Without perfectly permission. fine. Without that is the key without phrase, the permission without the permission. If you want to set up your social soup kitchens, good on you. Go get a job, save up some money, buy some property and use it for whatever your heart uh, tells you to do. You don't just rock up to someone else's property because you think uh, you've got a decent social purpose, do you? But these two have completely different opinions. What do you make to it all? GBviews at GBnews.com. If you want to email me as well, that's how you can get a hold of me today. Uh, also, National Trust after the break. Do you think they're losing the plot a little bit or not? I'll tell you why in two. Martin Dalby. Weekdays from 3 p.m. This new hate crime bill on women's issues. You think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red, uh, Muppet style thing. And some of the things that Hamza Youssef said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law, who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two-hour online training course they're meant to have done, and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be, in particular, abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful. That you know, Even after years of trying to study it, I can't understand why people hold this belief. But it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the Scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce. So it tried to introduce gender self-ID, but that was overruled by Westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government. It's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law, which sounds nice but isn't nice. It actually criminalises proper ethical treatment of gender-confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards and then this uh, hate crime law which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual reality based clear understandable way about all these measures it all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes and that recognizing that matters for women's rights especially Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah.
Just kidding. Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubry with you. It's till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, Alex Dean, uh, the Conservative candidate for Finchley and Golders Green and the political organiser and author, James Schneider. Let's talk National Trust. Uh, long story short, um, somebody passed away and they passed over to the National Trust uh, some assets which included a piece of land. The wishes, a memor memorandum of wishes, essentially said that uh, the, the owner of this land wanted it to be used uh, for recreation purposes free of charge. I'm trying to get to the point as quick as I can on this. The National Trust have now decided um, essentially to turn over uh, this land instead uh, to help them meet their biodiversity, conservation and eco-targets, i.e. not for the uh, wishes of which it was intended. It's one of those rare moments, I think, Michelle, of disag real disagreement between us, because as long as you think the National Trust should occupy this position, then they, they have a, in a privilege in our national life, then they're going to have the ability to do things like this. And I think you can still use land that's being used for biodiversity and so forth for recreational purposes. I mean, it seems to me this is a single piece of land, oh well. Much bigger issues for me are them posthumously outing people as being gay in, uh, from history or self-flagellating over supposed slavery of the people who've been kind enough uh, to gift them land in their wills. So I think the National Trust has completely lost its direction. But if you want to pick evidence, this would be the last place I'd start. I regard this as a legitimate change of use. James? So, from what I can work out here, I mean, firstly, I think it's a mistake to turn over uh, something that's been a sports pitch for a long time to another use. But now, I, I might have this wrong because I'm not an expert in it, but it seems to me that one of the potential real benefits of leaving the EU was that we would change common agricultural policy and so how we did subsidy for the countryside could change. And that's what Michael Gove brought forward. And within that, it's trying to move um, landowners towards biodiversity and so on. And it seems to me that if the National Trust is doing this in order to follow those new regulations, those regulations need a tweak. Because if it's, it, it's taking some land which already has a good social use, i.e. a sports field, that's good for the environment, it's good for health, it's good for the society, they should take another bit of land that they have around the corner in, I'm assuming, what's on a stately home and therefore they've got plenty of it, and turn that into the biodiversity plot. So, to me, it doesn't seem like this is really a story about the National Trust at all. This is a story mm. about how we, do our, how we regulate to, um, land use and uh, it seems like something which it was well-meaning, I, I actually think, I'm being very friendly to the government here, much more than I would usually, a well-meaning attempt to change us from common agriculture policy to something that does more for biodiversity has some flaw in it which could be tweaked and we wouldn't have this kind of I issue. think this is more of a National Trust policy, though, because just to say what they say, they say they're committed to creating uh, 25,000 hectares of new wildlife habitats by 2025 to pro provide sure. more opportunities to connect with nature and they also promote ethical uh, consumerism as an important way of life by supporting those are farms, legitimate et aims. Mm -hmm. Those are legitimate aims and, moreover, I gather from the article I've read about this, that the land concerned was rented, was leased by the local council and the lease is up. Well, you know, uses change when your lease runs out. So are you not a fan of the National Trust, not, at all, not but, broadly? But, not at all, but the point here is the lease is up and the people who are giving up the lease seem to think that they have the ability to insist on still using it when the lease is gone. I mean, that's as absurd as saying someone can squat in commercial property for as long as they like. Wasn't it... it um... Uh, I, just from the article I, I read, wasn't it the lease had no fee attached to it? So you can see how a community thought that, well, you know, we're always going to have That's this... That's not how the law works. We're, we're always going to have this pitch. Anyway, I, it, it doesn't seem to me... I, I agree with Alex that it doesn't seem to be um, a kind of really much of a culture war issue. It might be a... It might be a misapplication of some rules, which is what I guess it is, without knowing that much about it, or it might be a legitimate use of change of use of land, which is Alex's position. I'm almost out of time, but very, very quickly, one of my viewers, Peter, says National Trust is not fit for purpose. They are a work pressure group that despises British history. Just very quickly, do you agree with that or not? Um, 
No, but I mean, I don't know a tremendous amount about it. And I'm, I was very surprised about six months ago when I came on and Alex started ranting about the National Trust. And I, I was the first I'd heard that apparently everyone, you know, that some people hate it. I it seemed to me it's a stately home place. My view right? remains unchanged. <laughs> um, on squatting, Penny says, Michelle, I don't see the harm in squatting. Um, people are homeless, buildings are empty, so it doesn't make sense. Uh, sh no, she says, surely doesn't it make sense that someone else can get the benefit out of it? As long as they're peaceful, I don't see a problem. Would you want someone occupying your house, squatting in it as long as they're peaceful without your permission? No, thank you. I've been grabbing them out by the scruff of the neck and yanking them straight out of there. It was my property. I can tell you that for free. Uh, Michael uh, says, my home was squatted in for five weeks. I had to live in a tent. <laughs> it was awful. He says the council wouldn't do anything. And then they made me pay the rent for the weeks that I couldn't live in my home as well. Uh, Carol says, no, you shouldn't have the right to squat. Uh, many people wreck these buildings as well. And Annette says, uh, if people break into a property that does not belongs and they're breaking the law and simple they should be arrested uh, she says um, Alan says Michelle this is not about empty properties it's about who do they belong to if it's empty and it's been empty for years it is that the decision of the owner look time flies James Alex thank you very, thank much. You very much up next everyone Farage you won't want to miss this he'll be bringing you up to speed with everything that's been going on in Brussels from me night. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction. And with isobars out and opening out as well, lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. Touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go. But generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday, the weekend looks very nice indeed. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good evening, I'm Johnny Ratner with your very latest long keys from Greater Manchester on the M67. The eastbound carriageway of the motorway has been closed from Junction 3 at Hyde to where it meets the A57 where a vehicle is on fire. And the clockwise carriageway of the M60 continues to crawl for at least half an hour towards Trafford Park Junction 9 after an earlier collision. Nottinghamshire, the A614 is closed between Ollerton and Fallsby, that stretch of Blythe Road where a collision is being investigated. In Devon, the A380 remains shut southbound from Ashcombe down to King's Tainton for accidents investigation work. And in Cornwall, the A38 has been blocked westbound on the Liscard Road between Saltash and Notter. So this is just west of the Tamar Bridge following a multi-vehicle collision. And all flights have been suspended to and from Birmingham International Airport. There's an incident being dealt with just off the runway. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. 
For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good evening. I'm joining you live from Brussels, where I've been attending the NatCon conference, which the Belgian police tried to close down. No alternative views are allowed in this city. We must all support ever closer union, or the old bill will come and take us away. Joining